Today's scripture lesson comes from St. Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome, a text in which Paul has written a book, or Ted has written a book, I mean. Hear now these ancient words. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but of the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience." Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. There's a spiritual that sings, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Do you ever feel that way sometimes? As if we're alone, abandoned, as if the heavens are empty and silent, as if our lives had no significance or meaning. When Paul was writing to the small group of Christ followers in Rome, he was writing to those people in a society that seemed to be abandoned by the gods. The empire was at the height of its power. The signs of prosperity seemed everywhere with impressive monuments and temples gleaming in the city and goods flowing into the capital of the empire from all over the world. And yet underneath it all, there seemed to have been a great sense of unease. Although Roman imperial power was unparalleled in the world, yet it seemed to have lost its point and its purpose. Leaders like Caligula and Nero seemed uninterested in the fate of the masses of the people, obsessed with their own power and glory. Rome that had brought law to the world had sunk into lawless dictatorship. The gods of Rome had fallen silent. History seemed to have come to an end. There were no more worlds left to conquer, no more great achievements that would justify the sacrifices imposed upon the people of the empire. And it was into this world that Paul had come with his strange message concerning a Messiah who had been executed by that empire and repudiated by the religious leaders of God's own people. But through Jesus, he maintained, God had begun a new and unheard of thing, a completely new way of entering into history and turning history upside down. For God did not come as one of the powerful nor as one of the religious leaders. God came as one who had seemed to be utterly abandoned by God. For 
forsaken on the cross, while the heavens were dark and silent. Yet this same God had raised Jesus from the dead and thus overturned the whole order of the world that had been until then enforced by the threat of death. In the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God had subverted the order of the empire that threatened everyone with its violence and had subverted the religious powers that condemned and excluded ordinary people. For God had come precisely to those who seemed most cut off from God, those condemned to meaningless lives of bread and circuses, those who seemed to be alone in the universe, those who were condemned by the laws of empire and by the rules of religion. God had come to say, I claim you for my own. You are my adopted child. And no religious rules, no cosmic fate, no program of law and order will ever be able to separate you from my That was Paul's message to the motherless children of the empire. The image he uses is one that speaks volumes to the people of his time. In those days when a child was born into a household, its fate rested entirely on the whim of the head of the household, the father. It was he who decided whether a child would be part of the household or instead abandoned and sent outside the city gates and left to its fate. Sometimes this would mean that the child was left to starve or to be food for wild animals or to be picked up by slave traders who would raise the child to be sold, often sent to one of the houses of prostitution that encircled the precincts of most temples in the center of the city. Thus with fear and trembling, the child would be brought into the room of the head of the household and laid at his feet. If he turned away, all would be lost. But if he stooped down and picked up the child, then the child was saved. And given all the protection of a member of the household, a son or daughter, who would be nourished to adulthood and given authority over the household in their turn. All the drama of an infant's life centered on this moment of adoption into the home or abandonment to a cruel fate. Those to whom Paul spoke were those who had seemed to be abandoned by their natural fathers. The fatherland of empire had reduced them to the status of insignificant cogs in a well-oiled machine that seemed to have no point. Their religion seemed to have abandoned them to the silence of the gods or the judgment of the law. They had been abandoned, left to die of neglect or be enslaved to meaningless rounds of labor that served only the interests of the powerful or to be distracted by degrading entertainments or bought off by cheap goods of no real value. Does any of that ring a bell for you? Yet Paul's message was that his strange God had found them, had found them in their abandonment and had stooped down and picked them up and made them to be God's own children. No wonder then that the earliest Christian response to the proclamation was the glad shout, Abba, Father. The cry of one who unexpectedly had been raised up to become a child forever claimed and never again to be abandoned, Abba. But how is one to believe such astonishing news? Paul answers, there is the testimony of the Spirit with our spirit. What does that mean? How does God's Spirit speak in such a way as to give testimony to our own spirit that we are the children of God? I'm going to quickly indicate three ways. 
in which we may hear this testimony in our own lives. The first is the assurance that comes upon us in unexpected ways and times that God does love us, that our lives do have meaning, that we are destined to be partakers of the divine radiance. Sometimes it happens in church through the proclamation of the good news of divine grace, or through the welcoming of new neighbors into the community of faith or partaking in the bread and wine that make the divine love uh, visible and palpable, or singing the songs of the Spirit that unite us in one voice of praise. In so many ways, the good news enters our hearts and we feel joy and peace with God and our neighbors, but this same joy and peace also comes to us or may come to us outside the church. In the sunrise over the lake or the laughter of children, or the friendliness of strangers, a message that life has meaning because of love, a love greater than all the loves that are its echo and image in our lives. I'm a Methodist, so I know that John Wesley spoke of the doctrine of assurance and claimed we could really know at the very bottom of our being that we are children of the God who has in Christ Jesus stooped down to lift us up. There's another sort of testimony that is also the testimony of the Spirit, what Paul calls the groaning, the groaning for redemption. Because there are times in our lives when instead of that calm elation that knows the love of God through the word preached or friendship that takes us by surprise, we feel instead an almost nameless longing, the deep groaning of our spirit, a sighing too deep words. Perhaps it happens when we see the news from far away of hurricane or earthquake, or when we see the hopelessness of our neighbors, or the suffering of those who seem to be abandoned by an indifferent world, an unjust society, an absent God. We see the violence of the world the way the mighty destroy the helpless in Bangladesh or the streets of Ferguson or scores of other places all around our society and all around the world. We become aware of the plight of those who are condemned to death by the indifference of the world, the millions of children who die every year of needless poverty, the near myriads condemned to die by the ravages of AIDS in Africa or here at home without adequate care, without dignity. We see an earth reeling from human-made disaster, the extermination of whole species, victims of greed and carelessness, and our hearts groan. Something in us cries out in protest against all this meaningless suffering, this needless waste of life and beauty. Something in us cannot be at ease with this, no matter how much we may have been bribed into complacency by the demands and comforts of our everyday life. Paul also speaks of this as the testimony of the Spirit. Our very groaning for the redemption of the earth from violence and violation, from avarice and indifference, for Paul says the whole creation has been groaning and not only the creation, but we ourselves, he says, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan while we wait for adoption. Indeed, Paul writes that it is the Spirit itself that intercedes with us with sighs too deep. In this groaning and sighing for the deliverance of earth and humanity, we are united with the yearning of creation and with the groaning of God, the groaning of God, who yearns to deliver the earth from bondage to violence and avarice and indifference. It is then not only in moments of elation that God's Spirit testifies within us that we're children of God, 
It's also when we share with God in solidarity with all creation that longs for redemption, for liberation from bondage to death and decay, for this cry within us is God's own cry. And we may know that we are children of God when we share in God's own longing for the deliverance of all humanity and all creation from death and decay. To these testimonies, we may also add a third, where Paul says, all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. By speaking of being led by the Spirit, he's speaking of a way of life a way of walking, as he also says. What does that mean? Recall again the image of the child who unexpectedly has been adopted into the household, who knows that he and she has been loved and will always be loved. Kids love to imitate the people who love them. For better or for worse. <laughs> they put on boots that are too big for them. They speak as those who love them speak. They try to do the things that those who love them do. Children who are loved become imitators of those who love them. In Ephesians, the writer says, be imitators of God as beloved children. A few decades after Paul, an unknown Christian writer, wrote a small treatise to someone who was asking what it might mean to be a Christian. It's known simply as the letter to Diognetus, but it's one of the most beautiful texts in the history of early church. The author writes, do not be surprised that a person can become an imitator of God. Whoever takes upon himself his neighbor's burden, whoever wishes to benefit another who is worse off and something he himself is better off, whoever provides to those in need things that she has received from God, thus becomes divine to those who receive them. This one, this one is an imitator of God. So we know we're children of God when, like young kids, we try to do the things that God does. Befriend the friendless, rescue the abandoned, provide what is necessary to the vulnerable and the violated. By deeds of solidarity and mercy, we imitate the one who loves us and so become living witnesses who announce in our lives that God has come to adopt a seemingly abandoned earth, a seemingly abandoned planet. In the 21st century, there are many who feel themselves abandoned by God, given over to meaningless systems of aimless power and empty prosperity, for whom the heavens are empty and silent. And many of us find ourselves in this same condition from time to time. And yet there is something else. The testimony of God's Spirit with our spirit that we are children of God. Friends, hear the good news. You have been adopted by God. God has stooped down to us in Christ Jesus to make us God's own children, destined to take our place in the reign of God. You don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take Paul's word for it. For the Spirit of God gives testimony with your spirit. When your heart is invaded by wonder at the power of love, when your heart groans with the suffering of humanity and the earth, 
when you find yourself imitating the divine mercy and reaching out to those who have been abandoned. Then, the Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you have been adopted by the one who stooped down in Christ Jesus. Such is the unspeakable privilege of those who are adopted by the very love that set the earth in motion and has come to reclaim the earth and you and me from bondage to death. Thanks be 